I'm making one of the most epic swords of my life, and I'm inviting you to be a part of the journey. You get one bad weld in this entire giant billet, it would just ruin the whole thing. Whoa, easy, easy. Whoa, look at that. Wow, look at that pattern. It is day eight of working on the Griffin sword, and you might see that I'm all dressed up in my heavy Carhartt coat because today it is snowing out. We don't get very much snow here in Missouri, but it poured down snow this morning. In fact, it's still snowing really hard, and we actually need to go out there, get the billet out of the forge because I let it cool down slowly overnight. I need to get it out and rough grind all that scale off outside in the snow and cold. The next forging session, when I forge weld these tiles together, it'll actually be time to forge out the blade. So we're almost done making the Damascus for this sword. Coffee break. Let's take a trek into the great unknown. Whoa, oh man, it's white out. You put my forging glasses on because of how bright it is out here, man. Jeez, it is so bright. <laughs> I'm not used to snow. It does not snow very much in Missouri. We might get a whole year where we don't get a snow this deep. It's probably like four or five inches. And yeah, sometimes we'll get like two snows like this in a year. Sometimes it'll be three years before we get one this deep. So white. Probably won't catch the yard on fire today. Probably. I need to turn off this hose before I forget it. I think it was on. Whoa. These shoes are anti-slip, but more like for grease, not for harsh weather. All right, you gotta knock the scale off this billet. Here we go. I'm, I'm curious to see what the sparks will do to the snow over there. Uh, apparently the sparks, oh, there's a little bit of gray right there, I guess. Oh, billet's warming up. Let me see if I can launch a snowball at Josh. <laughs> oh. Whew. I should have gave my shoes a fresh coat of leather sealer before today. Kept them from getting all wet, but I didn't, so they're all wet. Oh. I got the handle cut off the billet and I also ran it over the two x 72 a little bit just to flatten it enough to get it on the surface grinder. And that's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna use my 1958 Benton Harbor, Michigan made Coville surface grinder. This thing is like 2,500 pounds of goodness. We've got an electromagnetic chuck on here. I can pop that billet on there. It's not completely flat, but I think it's flat enough. See, I can just freely move it. Well, watch when I turn this magnet on. Boop, it's on. That is solid on there, not coming off. I'm gonna get this turned on and start surfacing the billet on both sides. I think I'll be surface grinding for 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how much material I have to remove and how flat my billet is. Now, if I have a little bad spot, let's say there's some scale shoved in the billet somewhere, I am not gonna grind the entire surface down in order to get rid of that. What we'll end up doing is getting the majority of the billet cleaned up and then later after the tiles are cut up, if I have one that has an extra deep spot, we'll grind it there. But I don't wanna lose a lot of material to grind the entire billet down just for like one bad spot. Definitely don't wanna do that. To dress the surface grinding wheel, I'm actually using something that probably isn't quite the right tool, but I found it works amazingly well. I'm using a dressing tool that's actually made for a bench grinder. But the reason I keep coming back to this dresser is because it seems to leave the wheel in a serrated state. If you have any experience with dressing a surface grinder wheel in order to make it cut aggressively using something that's more surface grinder approved instead of this kind of hillbilly hobo way I'm doing it here. I've tried a bunch of different things in the past and nothing's worked nearly as good as this, but I'd love to hear if there's something that's more surface grinder approved that will get me the same or better results. I 
I finished surface grinding the billet. It took me about 15 or 20 minutes. I got most of it cleaned up. There's a little bit that we'll have to clean up later on the belt grinder once these, is cut. Once these are cut up into tiles. We're gonna cut it up into 14 tiles to make the sword out of. What this is gonna do is it's gonna reveal the pattern. Right now, this mosaic bar has this super cool mosaic pattern that we created, but it's just on the end of the bar. If you actually etched the sides of the bar and looked at the pattern on the sides and the edges, it would just be a bunch of straight lines. Not very interesting at all compared to how cool the mosaic is. So when we cut this entire billet up into these tiles, we're gonna flip the tiles around in a certain way to make it so that pattern you see on the end of the bar will become the pattern that you see on the sides of the blade. It's kind of like a super cool magic trick to really reveal that mosaic pattern. I'm gonna head over to the bandsaw and start cutting. This is gonna be a whole lot of cutting for the bandsaw. I mean a whole lot. We got 14 of these tiles to cut through. This billet's two and a quarter inches wide and an inch and an eighth thick. That's a lot of steel to cut. I'm cutting up all these tiles on a 35 degree angle. Played around with quite a few different angles and that's my, uh, my favorite angle to do the tile welded mosaics on. I got all 14 of the tiles cut up on the bandsaw. That took a while. Also, as the billet started to get really short, I CA glued it to a two by four in order to keep holding it out there further and further. Next thing I need to do is get rid of this little burr on here and flatten one side of these, the side that the saw just cut through. That way we can put them on the surface grinder and I'm gonna surface grind uh, most of them down, get them all to about the same thickness. I'm not gonna make them all perfect, I just want them close. They should be pretty close already though because I was careful to follow my lines on the bandsaw and I'm gonna use this two by 72 with a 36 grip belt right here. And now it is surface grinder time once again. I don't know if they'll all fit in here. Uh, lengthways, might be too long, 14. Yeah, I don't think they will. They don't all fit on there, I'm left with two. It wasn't until I got these tiles all cut up on the bandsaw that I had the idea that maybe I should check the Excelsior sword build and see how many tiles I had for that. Well, I counted them and there was actually 16 tiles for the Excelsior build and I only have 14 for this. I really hope I have enough material for this sword. If I run short on material, this is gonna be a disaster. I have to make sure this blade comes out at least 38 inches long and I need plenty of material for the tang too. Hopefully two tiles less isn't gonna be an issue, but I'm starting to get a little bit worried here. I've done surface grinding the pieces. I've got them all down to uh, mostly the same height. There's still a few that are a little bit shorter, but at least we've equaled them out a little bit. Just removed a tiny bit of material from some of them that were a little bit longer. Next thing you need to do is take them over to a 120 grit belt and we're gonna grind these angled surfaces. These angled little surfaces here are gonna be what mates together. When we take two of these tiles, if I can get that off there, these angled surfaces are gonna forge weld to each other just like this. Now, if I lay the billet out like this, this is how it used to be. So these angled surfaces that I'm about to grind on and clean up, these are what we first surface ground clean. There are a couple places where there's some scale or something left because I didn't want to waste more material than I had to and grind the whole billet down. So in those places, now will be the time where I get rid of that scale and clean these all up. Because we're going to have these as the mating surfaces and we want them to be perfectly clean. As I was grinding this surface clean, I noticed if the light hits it just right in the middle, I almost feel like I see something. It might be some leftover uh, weld that I didn't grind out. You know, a little of that, uh, the TIG rod or the MIG welder. Uh, I'm not really sure though, it's so fine. It's probably not a problem, but I thought just to be safe, I would do a little ferric chloride dip real quick. And uh, hopefully that would reveal any issues. So that's 120 grit finish. Dip it in a little ferric chloride. Hopefully it's not gonna be a big deal. 
Here's what I was talking about. Right in the middle of the billet, there's just this little, this little part that's just faded a different color ever so slightly. I actually do believe that that's a little bit of residual weld right there. But if I look at the, uh, the surface of the billet, this is what we're gonna see on the sides of the knife. Right there is where that weld would be. If that really is weld, it's so shallow that you can't even see it from looking at it this direction. So I don't think I'm gonna worry about it at all. Now, if I flip this over and I saw a big old round spot of weld there, then, then something would have to be addressed. You'd have to like grind this surface down. But since I can't see it there, I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm trying to leave a nice 120 grit finish on these tiles where they're gonna forge weld together. So I'm removing the surface grinder finish that's currently on here. And some of the tiles have a little bit of scale and stuff on there in a couple places. And I'm making sure to get all that down to clean metal too. Turns out that weld left in the billet wasn't settling right with me. There were some little impurities where the weld met up with the Damascus billet. So I decided to go ahead and grind those out. I had to take it back to 50 grit and now the angles might be messed up a little bit and everything. I hope that all, all doesn't lead to compounding problems. I think that got left in there because I had a big gap and uh, I was laying TIG rod over it. The reason I had a big gap was because I didn't square my bar up properly before I four weighed it that last time. So it was just like this compounding problem. I did grind the welds out, but obviously I didn't grind deep enough with that one and I left it in there. So anyway, I ground all that out. There's no weld left in there now, but I did grind away some of the Damascus pattern with 50 grit in order to get rid of that. And I need to bring them back up to 150 grit, but it is the end of the day and I can go no further on that for now. It's day nine. <coughs> It's day nine, I've got all the pieces cleaned up, ready to go. But before we start putting all these together, we need a few more. We need some pieces for the tang. I have enough mosaic here for the blade, I hope, hope. But I need more pieces for the tang. The tang doesn't need to be the same pretty pattern. So I could either use just like some 1080 steel, but I don't have any really massive size and I don't really want to forge weld some together. So I've decided to actually take this scrap piece of mosaic from another project, who knows how many years ago that's been laying around, and we're gonna cut this up into a couple of more tiles. This piece is almost the same width as the other billet. It's slightly skinnier, but it's close enough. We're gonna cut this up into like three more tiles and use this as the sacrificial tang material. So we're not using up the good mosaic uh, for the tang. Got the three pieces for the tang prepared. I've also laid out the whole billet here so we can see how big it is because I need to cut some sheet metal. We're gonna put sheet metal on the both sides of the uh, billet. So I need two strips about 24 and a half inches long and there's almost no numbers left on my ruler there. We'll probably go one, two, three, maybe three inches wide. And now it is time to reveal Sheet Metal's number one mortal enemy, the Nibbler. <laughs> the destroyer of sheets of metal everywhere. Ha <laughs> ha 
You get one bad weld in this entire giant billet, it would just ruin the whole thing. You know, if one of these tiles doesn't want to weld up properly to another one, they could all be good if that one is messed up. <laughs> that would be it. I want to show you exactly why I cut up this billet into tiles. And that main reason is so we can see the Damascus pattern on the sides of the sword. Because right now, the edges of this bar just have straight lines running down them. If you etch the Damascus, it's all just straight lines. But on the end of the bar is a really cool mosaic Damascus pattern. So just to illustrate how we're gonna transfer that pattern to the sides of the sword, I went ahead and drew little explosion-y pictures on the ends of each one of these tiles. And that'll illustrate our pretty mosaic pattern that we want across the sides of the blade. So we're gonna take this entire mosaic billet and we're gonna flip it all over just like this. And when we put these tiles together, because they're cut on an angle, that'll give a weld surface for the two pieces to be able to mate up and forge weld together on that angled surface. When we press this down in the hydraulic press, since there's a little bit of an angle there, the pieces will press onto each other and they'll make that a really strong forge weld. If these pieces weren't cut on an angle, we would have a seam that's just straight up and down and it would be much more difficult to get that to forge weld together. If we take this whole billet and lay it out, you can see how it'll transfer that pattern that's on the end of the bar to now becoming the sides of the blade. When we forge weld this entire billet up like this, we'll have that repeating mosaic pattern all the way down the sides of the sword blade on both sides, instead of it just being straight lines. Got all the tiles ready to go. Got our sheet metal ready to go. I'm gonna clamp a couple pieces down to the sheet metal at a time, tack weld them in place. Once I get all the tiles tacked down to the sheet metal, I'll weld the other piece on and then seal all the seams up so we'll be able to do nice, clean, zero atmosphere forge welding on this. I used to use the TIG welder to tack the tiles down to the sheet metal and then seal everything up with the TIG welder. But these days I find it much quicker to just go ahead and use the MIG welder to tack the pieces down and then seal it all up. And the benefit of the MIG welder is it's gonna add a lot of filler material onto the edge of the pieces, which will add strength to the entire billet, giving it a little bit more integrity for when I put it in and out of the forge, just to make sure nothing falls apart. Having all that MIG welder wire on the edge of the billet isn't gonna be a problem because after we get this billet forge welded and drawn out a little bit, I'll grind all that material away so it doesn't end up in the final Damascus sword. It's time to get a handle on the situation. That's as far as I'm going on that billet today. It's ready to go in the forge and get that thing forge welded together, get it drawn out into an actual sword blade. But right now, I've got to go voiceover part two of the YouTube Griffin video. It's day 11 of working on the Griffin sword. We didn't video day 10 because I pretty much spent the whole day staring at the sketch staring at metal pieces, staring at the sketch, and then doing some grinding. So what I actually did on day 10 of working on the Griffin sword, besides staring at metal and sketches, were to make these two patterns. This pattern right here is a half sword pattern. So this represents half of the sword blade and some of the tang. And then this one is the full sword blade. I need this for when we forge out the mosaic pattern to be able to make sure that I forge the blade long enough, make sure that it's got the right taper and everything on it. This is gonna be so handy when it comes to actually forging out the blade. So that's why I wanted to go ahead and stop and make those patterns and didn't video it because it was involving just a lot of me staring at things. Today, it is finally time to get that mosaic billet in the forge, get all the tiles forge welded together into one piece and then start drawing them out into our actual sword blade. I hope to get the blade forged out and uh, get the taper done on everything on it and get the blade ready for grinding by the end of the day. That's the hope. Also, I really hope all those tiles forge weld together properly. One messed up forge weld on one of those tiles somewhere and the whole blade will be ruined. It doesn't matter if all the other welds come out perfect. If one of them doesn't, then it's pretty much scrap. Mm -hmm. 
I think the forge could actually handle heating up this entire billet at once, but I don't think I want to do that. I don't think there'd be enough time to try to get uh, the entire billet forge welded together all in one heat. So I think I'm going to kind of focus on half of the billet at a time when it comes to getting these forge welded tiles forge welded together. One of the reasons I like using sheet metal with my tile mosaic billets is because it adds more structure to the billet. Especially with a billet this long for the sword, it gives a lot of structural support to the billet as I'm taking it in and out of the forge. Having the sheet metal add that structural integrity isn't really important when the billet's cold, but when you heat that billet up and it's really long and there's a lot of weight, everything starts to want to sag and move on you, having the sheet metal there is sealing the billet off and adding that little bit of structure. And don't worry about the sheet metal at all. This is only 32 thousandths thick. By time I'm done forging this sword out over multiple, multiple heats, all that sheet metal is gonna end up falling off as scale, or at least most of it will. And then the rest of it will get surface ground off once I go to clean up the sword later on. At this point in the Damascus making process, I have to be very careful. The billet is much thinner and longer than it was in previous stages of making the Damascus. So that means it could be very easy for me to overheat the steel and actually melt my billet in half in the forge. I want my billet to be in the range of 2200 to maybe 2300 degrees Fahrenheit when I'm forge welding. If I go another one or 200 degrees over that 2300, then the billet could melt in half because that's right around the melting temperature of the carbon steel I'm using. So I gotta be very careful not to get it too hot. Oh yeah, we're getting there. That actually looks like a lot of metal still when I look at it next to this. Wow. That's tapered a lot. Yeah. Tapered too much? Is it too skinny out here? Nah. Yeah? I don't know. I have to re reconsider my entire sword design. I really don't mind babying this a bunch if it means getting those welds really good. Got these modified sword tongs from last time I was doing a sword. Yeah, those lock into place really nice because I made those big old draws for them. I left that little chunk on there to help me kind of identify the tang end. But the only thing is whether or not I identified it correctly when I was welding all this together or not, or if I accidentally messed up back then. Try to get this whole bar down to about three eighths of an inch. There's something very important I want to talk to you about. When you're forging out your blades, make sure you keep them nice and straight. Here's a good example of what a very straight blade looks like. This one, I couldn't be more proud of how straight I've kept this blade. Since I'm keeping it so straight, it'll make uh, all the process later easier. If you don't keep your blades at least as straight as this one, which is perfectly straight by the way, then uh, you're gonna run into serious, serious problems and you might have to scrap your entire project. Keep your blades straight. Hey, it's long enough, we're done. Stock removal, the rest. Well, the tub, stub, stub on for the tang except the, the good pattern doesn't start to about right here. Get off my knee. Oh yeah, now we're, now we're getting nice and straight. You haven't seen nothing about how straight things can be yet.
I'm really thinking I maybe forged it a little thinner than I needed to because we still have to taper it. Uh, yeah, probably Matt's, probably Matt, I could have left it a little thicker then. I've waited as long as possible to grind these MIG welds off the edges so I could make multiple passes, drawing the billet out, stretching it, without having to worry about any of the little corners tearing open. The billet can lose too much heat and it can put a lot of stress right on those tile welds and you can get the very, very little corner kind of tear open on you or something. Now I'm not sure the sheet metal is gone enough for us to be able to see the pattern there, but I don't want to grind off more than I need to any either. This wasn't supposed to look good for the camera. This is just supposed to look good enough for me to be able to do, make some marks and make sure that I'm in the right spot. I've laid myself out a line right where the tang material and the sword blade material starts. I can see that transition right here. I'm gonna make myself a little notch, maybe with the angle grinder on the edges, just so I'll be able to always identify where that spot is, where the blade starts. Then I'm gonna eat some lunch and after that, we're gonna put this back in the forge and begin forging in some of the blade taper. For lunches, two thirds of the time, either my mom or my sister will bless us with some delicious food. Some of the things we've eaten in the past are beef stew, roast beef, Moroccan chicken, enchilada, shepherd's pie, sous vide steak, pizza soup, chili, tacos, meatloaf, hamburgers, beans and fry bread, pizza, corn chowder, spaghetti, lasagna, grilled cheese, egg rolls, barbecued ribs, pulled pork, BLTs, etc., etc. Wow, look at that twist in that. Wow. Yeah, we're getting there. I want it to be, I want it to kind of match the uh, taper of the blade, but I don't want it to be, uh, I want to give myself a fair amount of wiggle room. I just want it to look like the pattern is stretched out with the uh, shape of the blade without overdoing it. You, know, you have no idea how much skill's going into running that thing without any stops or anything in there, making a taper without just smashing the thing in half and destroying it. If only you knew the power of the dark side. If you only knew the power of the dark side. I mean, I could still technically go more, but... Uh, Yeah, I kind of, I think I should start uh, straightening that out maybe. We'll see how that looks. I don't think I'm gonna stress over getting it perfectly straight the uh, this way. You know, this way. I don't think I'm gonna stress about it as much as I have in the past because when we go to surface grind it, the surface grinder is gonna put so much weird stress all over the thing, it's gonna make it warp a bunch anyway. Wish we had a surface grinder that I could do the whole thing on. Ugh. It's, it's literally like this up here like that in the middle this way and then back that way it's so hard to see down it when it's that long okay it's starting to wear on me getting heavier. Well, technically it's getting lighter, but it feels like it's getting heavier. It's not straight that way anymore. Just keeps moving. Just keeps moving this way and moving this way. Look at the, look at that. Just completely pulled up off. That was touching a minute ago. 
Look at it. Look at it move. Straightening the blade on the metal workbench is not working very well. When you first place the blade on the table, the tip lifts way up in the air as the blade's cooling down. And then at a certain point, the tip starts lowering back down and you can actually see it moving. It's moving like a quarter of an inch, which is a lot when it comes to getting this blade straight. So I think to get this blade straightened, I'm gonna have to do it the old fashioned way and just sit there at the anvil, tap on it a little bit, eyeball it and continue from there until I get this thing as straight as possible. I gotta kinda get it in like one take though, cause every time I put it in there and heat it back up, you pull it out and it's super warped. <laughs> it's not like I can get it close and then heat it up again and then finish it, cause every time you heat it up, it comes out all bananaed. <laughs> Wish there was, there's probably a perfect ratio I could heat the whole blade up evenly, take it out, shake it on its side a little bit, flip it over on the other side and shake it on its side and it would like auto straighten yeah, itself. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> It's the end of the day. I'm exhausted from wielding this thing, trying to get it straight. I think I've got it pretty straight for now. I'm gonna see tomorrow when it's cooled down, I'll be able to inspect it a lot better and see if it's straight. We still need to get the tang forged out on it. Uh, so even if it is straight, I'm gonna have to do some fiddling with it, but I needed to be able to at least get it pretty close to straight before I went ahead and made it even longer and harder to handle. We got that entire mosaic forged out. As far as I can tell, it feels like it came out really solid today, so I'm very happy about that. Something else that really helped was I had Josh put one of his lights down there and it made it so I could look down the blade a little bit easier, because before, when the blade cooled down a little bit, it would just all blend in with the gray concrete, but that made it stand out a little bit so I could try to eyeball if it was straight or not. But yeah, we'll find out tomorrow if it's fully straight, but I'm pretty happy with what we got done on this thing today. It's day 12 of working on the Griffin Sword, and today I'm hoping to finish forging the blade. So we gotta straighten it, forge the tang out, and also start doing some surface grinding and stuff on it as well today. I've inspected this blade. It looks nice and straight now that I can hold it and it's not piping hot like it was yesterday. I'm gonna go ahead and stick this in there tang first, and we're gonna start off the day by forging this tang out. I'm gonna forge it down until it's about an inch, inch and a quarter or so, and uh, it's gonna get quite a bit longer than this. And then once that's done, we'll continue straightening the blade, make sure it looks all good, and then let it cool. Yeah, my little marks are right there. Oh, that's not cool. What's that? I don't like that. Be one of the welds tearing. This can be really hard on the welds because forging, moving the metal a lot, <laughs> and also forging it while it's kind of cooler than normal. I actually think I was able to really leave the blade alone, even though a little of this got heated up. Looks like that's pretty much nice and straight already. So we are almost there with the tang. I just need to move it over a little bit. I'm gonna keep fussing with this tang a little bit. Next time you see this blade, hopefully it'll be completely forged out and nice and straight. I'm gonna be fiddling with it for a while, but it's pretty close now. After a little bit more tweaking, I finally got the tang where I wanted it to be and I got the blade nice and straight. When we look down at this way, it's pretty straight. It's not perfect, but it's straight enough. The next thing I wanna do is go ahead and knock this heavy scale off of here with the angle grinder. And then I'll probably take it over to the 2x72 and we'll try to flatten this out a little bit and prepare it for surface grinding. It's gonna be a lot of work to surface grind this. The last two swords I did, took me ages to surface grind because the magnet is only 18 inches long. So we can only work on 18 inch sections at a time, which means we have to overlap multiple sections in order to surface grind this whole blade. Let's take this outside and knock this scale off. You might wonder why I don't just start surface grinding right off the bat. Why do I even need to use the angle grinder? Well, the reason being the scale on the billet is really nasty and it has a tendency of clogging up the surface grinder wheel. So if I plop this right on the surface grinder, the wheel will get clogged up very quickly and I'll have to redress the wheel 
multiple times. But the angle grinder, on the other hand, has a much more aggressive coarse wheel, and it'll knock that scale off without getting so clogged up. It can even be an issue with an angle grinder, though. Sometimes those can get clogged up a little bit, too, and you might need to dress it by hitting it on a stone or something. I ground one side of the blade on the 2x72 just to flatten it a little bit, get rid of some of those high spots on there so it'll sit on the surface grinder magnet just that little bit better, hopefully. I also unscrewed the end cap on here. That hole on the uh, surface grinder there is from the previous two swords I did to be able to stick them through there. In my mind, there was also a hole on this other end, but uh, I guess I only ever made a hole on one end. I don't know if we're gonna need a second hole or not. This sword is bigger. The blade, yes, is only one inch longer, but the tang is probably a good four or five inches longer, so that's, that all adds up. But we probably don't need another hole, because I can work that end. Ooh, I can work the middle. Can I work the other end? From here, let's see if I can flip that around. Need to be able to work that plus overlap it a bit. Oh, yeah. I think one hole is enough. I really don't need the other hole there. This is gonna be really tricky. I've gotta surface grind this thing in multiple little sections because the surface grinder only moves about 19 inches. And this entire sword is like f almost 50 inches long currently. All right, uh, what's one of the thickest areas? I think it's the tip. So I guess we'll start at the tip first and do that. Yeah, that'll be the first ever section of surface grinding on this sword. I'm also gonna need to utilize a couple of weights. So I've got some big old pieces of W2 steel here. This is some excellent knife steel. Really good stuff that I got from Don Hansen, who's a master bladesmith, also lives in Missouri. What I'm gonna do with this is use it as a weight to hold down the part of the sword that's sticking out. If I set this on the sword, it'll make that, uh, it'll give it a little bit of tension and it'll make it flex downward just a little bit. And that'll be important for when I'm surface grinding. The surface grinder is gonna go past the table a little bit and if I don't have something adding a little bit of weight right here, it can, the heat from the wheel can kind of suck the metal up into it. But I've noticed when I did the previous swords that if I have a weight on there, it kind of holds that down and keeps the uh, surface grinder from doing really weird things right here where it's over the edge of the table. I guess that's it. Nothing left to say. I'm gonna turn on the surface grinder and start the long road of surface grinding. I'm so blessed to be able to have this massive surface grinder on hand. With that being said, I hope that if I do too many more swords in the future that I'll be able to get a longer surface grinder set up. It's a little bit difficult to grind this blade in little 18 inch sections considering that the overall blade is nearly 50 inches. I have to do multiple sections going down the blade. It's my dream that if I build many more swords that I'll figure out some way to either purchase or make some kind of a surface grinder that will do sword length projects. One alternative could be a sword length surface grinder attachment for the 2x72. If you don't know, the 2x72 grinder actually has surface grinder attachments and I use it occasionally. I don't use them a lot because they don't seem as flat as my Coville surface grinder. But for something like this, where I'm just trying to get the blade mostly flat and parallel on a long sword blade, that could be an awesome option to have. So I'm gonna try to look into that for the future. A sword length surface grinder attachment for the 2x72 grinder could be really handy to have. Are you tired of wasting valuable time searching for the tools and materials I use? I understand. Introducing the Mastersmith's Toolkit. It's a downloadable PDF that brings together all the links I use in one convenient place. Imagine having instant access to all the resources I use right at your fingertips. The best part is, the Mastersmith's Toolkit is absolutely free. That's right, sign up today and have instant access to all the tools and materials I use without spending a dime. So click the link in the description and sign up today. It's the end of the day and I am done working on the Griffin sword for today. I got both sides surface ground to where I'm pretty much to fresh clean metal. There's only a couple little places of scale here and there. That being said though, this blade is still really thick and I need to surface grind more off of it. But I think one of the next things I'm gonna wanna actually do is go ahead and get this thing normalized, which is part of the, the heat treating cycle to get the grain reset in it. 
I'm very happy with what I got done on this blade today though. I did a ton and a ton and a ton of surface grinding doing little sections at a time and this blade is coming together and looking wonderful. I'm gonna break a light bulb or something around me here. Kind of heavy still. Once you, once you get it moving, it doesn't want to stop. <laughs> Woo! It's day 13 of working on the Gryphon Sword, and I finally got this thing ground down to a thickness I'm happy with. I spent quite a bit of time surface grinding on this, and we've got it down to 270 thousandths of an inch thick. I want the final finished sword thickness to be right around 250 thousandths, which is one quarter of an inch. Today, the task is to get this blade normalized. Right now, the blade is under a tremendous amount of stress from being forged out, forge welded, all that layer manipulating we did, all the surface grinding I did on it. We need to relax the steel and prepare it for hardening and tempering. Hardening is where this blade will truly gain its soul. To normalize this blade, we're gonna heat it up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, let it cool and still air, heat it up again to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, let it cool and still air, and heat it up one more time to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, and then let it cool and still air until it's room temperature. And that will basically be like hitting the reset button on the steel. It'll get all the grain nice and relaxed, prepared for hardening and tempering later. If we didn't do this step, chances are that the blade would warp a lot more than it otherwise would during hardening. Uh, you could possibly not harden the blade properly. You might end up with really nasty brittle spots. To normalize the sword, I have my dad who has made a wonderful creation Tell us about what this thing is back here that keeps clicking on and off behind us. So we got uh, high temperature salts in here. Back over there against the, the uh, tank, I've got a PID controller. It's running two propane burners and they're hooked to the propane. It shuts propane off and on. You can hear it running right now. Our first target temperature is 1600 degrees and it's gonna maintain that temperature uh, plus or minus about a degree. It's pretty incredible. Tell us some of the benefits about heat treating and, and normalizing with salts, Dad. The heat transfers through salt and sand very well. Uh, the salt we're using here, it's 50, 52, 54 inches of salt, and our temperature variation is, is gonna be nominal. And it protects the steel, right? It protects the steel during the heat, the heat treat process, and there's, it doesn't develop any mill scale. So uh, you can almost have a semi-finished blade and be able to heat treat without the worry of excessive mill scale on your, on your semi-finished blade. This thing's super cool. This thing is terrifying too. It's got molten lava like salt glass in there and it's absolutely terrifying and I'm scared of it. And it hopefully is. it doesn't blow up. <laughs> it is terrifying. Apparently just condensation on your blade is enough moisture that it could make the salts blow up out of the tank and just molten lava spewing everywhere. So dad's got a vent hole for the, the propane burners. We're gonna stick the blade down in there first, down in the, uh, the vent hole and preheat the blade before we put it in the salts. We're also gonna be using a winch system that dad hooked up right up above here to lift the tank in and out. Well, we decided to use that for the blade today to lift it and lower it down in there. I probably won't be able to use that winch when it comes to actually quenching the blade because I'll have to move faster but I think it's gonna work really nicely for uh, the normal, uh, normalization process. Absolutely. Okay. <coughs> I have to have that on all the way. Uh, just line it up with that. We'll yeah. just, yeah, we can, it can be off to the side for the heater. It can be right there. Ready? Yeah. A little more. Okay, more. It's not touching the bottom yet. Okay. Yes, up all with tongs. Don't get over that that flame. That flame is the worst of it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, I got nice and high. Yeah. Alright, go down easy. <laughs> that scared me. You wanna look at it? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, hold it. Keep going down. I want to look at it. Well, oh, oh, uh, uh, give me another inch or two. Okay. There's about that much tank sticking up. Okay, it's in there. Oh man, molten lava, terrifying, scary stuff in there. Good time for a coffee break. That's gonna take a few minutes for it to heat back up because the blade sucks some of the thermal uh, thermal capacity out of the salt. So we gotta let them heat back up and then soak for a minute or two. And then we're gonna take the blade out and just let it cool and still air. The, the steel just needs to be heated up through. It doesn't need to doesn't need to soak if it's heated all the way through. But I would give it a couple minutes just to, you know, give the give it plenty of time for the bottom to normalize out with the top or whatever. Well, I love how dad's like got the, the helmet on but not down. <laughs> and no glasses, no, not even any safety glasses. I feel like you almost should be required to have safety glasses just to be in the shop with nothing on. Uh, let it soak a little bit. I'll, I wanna give it, you know, five minutes or something before we pull it out. Oh, <laughs> I didn't notice the top of that stainless steel glowing. All right, uh, let's take it out, Dad. Now, here's an idea. Is that thing dripping cool salts down into the hot salts a problem? No, no, it's nominal. Nope. Nominal? You mean like some condensation on the blade blowing up? It's negligible. <laughs> it's, it's negligible. All right, let's take it out. Uh, That's a good question. I don't think I'm gonna really do anything. I'm just gonna stand here. I don't know. Where is your, your pair of safety glasses? This is the first time you've looked for safety glasses since being here? <laughs> yeah, I can't on the word. I keep <laughs> Not on your face. Yeah. Oh, it's stuck. You want to come out. <coughs> Push harder. Whoa. Whoa. Easy, easy. Whoa, look at that. That is beautiful. Look at how gorgeously even that color looks. Look at that molten salt dripping off of it. Wow. Oh man, you can see the pattern a little bit. I'm curious to see how much we'll be able to see the pattern when this is all done. Well, that was cool. Um, I really like being able to use that winch. I'm kind of getting scared of when I have to manually pull it out and quench it by hand. There's not a lot of room there between the ceiling and the, uh, <laughs> the piece, but the winch isn't gonna be able to get it in the I think it's gonna to be too slow to get it in the oil and then start moving it. I think you're gonna to have to do it by hand. Yeah, go easy. <laughs> I got one speed. <laughs> gentle, put it on gentle speed. Whoa. <laughs> oh, that's far enough. Right there, yep. Josh, somebody at the Blade Show was telling me that he did this salt heat treating outside and even just a bird pooping in the salts, the moisture and the liquid in the poop set off the salts and made it like violently erupt out of the thing outside. That's why you don't wanna, you don't wanna put your face and you wanna keep your hands to a minimum when they're over that tank in case any little tiny bit of moisture gets in there. The only danger we have being around it here is if moisture gets in there and it blows up. It's not a problem if it blows up, but what goes up comes down. And I imagine it would hit that ceiling and probably splatter all over. So that's the uh, the danger in, in it hitting the ceiling. If it was just gonna go up and hit the ceiling, that wouldn't be dangerous. Also, burning the shop down would also be uh, bad too. What temperature, Dad? 815, which is 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. We're doing Celsius because the controller apparently only goes up to 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, but it'll go up a lot higher in Celsius for some reason. Maybe it's digits can only go up to 1100. <laughs> We're probably good to take it out. It's been three or five minutes now, huh? 
Okay, go. <laughs> oh, that is beautiful. Look at that color. Look at that molten glass stuff running off of it. That is so, that salt is, it looks like it's the thickness of water. It doesn't look, it doesn't look as thick and viscous, vis, viscous as I'd imagined, you know, like lava or magma seems like it would be dropping off in little chunks of gooey snot-like stuff. This is dropping off in little drips of something that looks thinner, much more closely related to water. See the drips coming off of it? They, they don't look nearly as sticky and gooey like molten lava like I imagined them to look. But when you look down in the tank, it looks like molten lava or magma. Is lava in ground and magma above ground? Or I'm sure I'm being really stupid right now. At least I know that one is one and the other is the other, but I don't know which one's which. It's called lava in the ground and magma out or, no, I think it's magma. I wanna say that it's magma when it's underground and lava above ground. You can see, you can see that stuff getting thicker as it cools down. The drips are a lot bigger yeah. And they are kind of building up on there like a stalactite. That was a 1500 degree cycle. We're gonna let that cool. By the time the salt tank is cooled down another 100 degrees down to 1400, the blade will be ready to go right back in there and we're gonna heat it up for the third and final time right now. Coffee break. Oops. <laughs> Might need to open my visor. Oh, that's good. A little cold, but good. Go ahead and go back down. I think the salt's lowered. It's cooling down. Yeah, I can't see him. Can you go down further? Yeah, I got a lot. A little more? Okay, right there. Yep. All right, third and final time. Just gotta let that heat up. Hopefully no birds fly in the shop and drop their blessings upon the salt tank and we'll be good. I've had birds fly in here before, uh, probably at least three or four different times. So as funny as a joke as that may sound, which isn't that funny, it could actually happen. Okay, here we go. This is the third and final part of the normalization cycle. We're gonna bring it out. It's been soaking at 1400 degrees. It's nice and dark in here. Let's see how this looks. Go, Dad. Oh, look at that beautiful color. Oh, that's such a creamy, beautiful orange. Careful, you can't see the top there, Dad. Woo! Oh, that looks so even and beautiful. Look at that molten lava stuff dripping off the bottom there. Wow. I love that color. I'm really curious once that's cool to see how much uh, to see how much scale and stuff's on the blade or how clean it is once we rinse it off. The blade's cooled down enough. I can go ahead and cut it loose here. Got a pair of wire cutters. I'm gonna try to cut this wire off. Oh, yeah, if I can. Yeah. There's one. There's two. There we go. I'm gonna cool this blade off and then we're gonna clean it up. Whoa, look at that rinse off. Whoa. I'm gonna go do some grinding on this blade to get it cleaned up and then we're gonna soak it in some instant coffee mixed with water for a few hours so we can see how the pattern looks on the sword. I finished cleaning up the blade. I ground on it with a little 120 and 320. I've also got a pot of hot water here that has about four ounces of Nescafe Bold Roast Instant Coffee. We're gonna dump it in this tube and all over my foot. Let me get the blade cleaned off and then we're gonna leave it in here for a few hours and we should be able to see what the pattern looks like. This is gonna be the first official pattern reveal on the sword. Perfect amount. I'm gonna rinse my foot. 
I gotta be careful not to cut myself. The uh, corners of this are actually very sharp. Just cleaning this off with a little Dawn dish soap. I wanna make sure I get rid of most of the oils on the blade. Okay, rinse that off and we should be good to go in the coffee. Okay, here we go. That's really high. <laughs> I'm gonna leave this for a few hours and hopefully we'll be able to see how this Damascus pattern looks all across the blade. Last time we saw it, it was just on one little tile, not on all 14 of these forge welded into this massive griffin sword. The griffin sword's been in the coffee for a few hours. Let's take it out here so I don't make a mess in the shop and see how this pattern looks. Whoa, man, that thing's long. Let me rinse it off a little bit. Whoa, look at that. Wow, look at that pattern. Oh, it looks so good. Oh, I love the, the really thick 15 and 20 things. Look at that. There's little circles all down through the pattern. We've got these flowery bits here with all these dark 1080 areas. Wow, that came out incredible. It all looks very homogenous, like one long piece of of Damascus. It doesn't look like a bunch of small individual tiles. Oh, and look at something else here. You can see that the pattern stretches out more and more towards the tip, which is what I wanted. I wanted it to, to look like the blade was forged, at least mostly to shape and kind of have that, that stretched out look as you got closer to the tip. I'm calling it there for the day. We got the blade normalized. Kevin, the salt heat treating oven worked beautifully. Dad did a great job on that. Every time we pulled this blade out, it had gorgeous, even colors all the way through the entire blade. And we got to see the pattern by leaving it in that coffee for a few hours. I am in love with this pattern. It looks so cool. Keep in mind, this is just put in coffee with like a rough finish on it. When this blade is heat treated and finished and etched and then darkened, the pattern is going to be incredible. I will see you in the next video. May the forge be with you. Bye-bye.